Surge and Stephanie Rivera and designer here in the corner. Oh. Uh, that we have Alex and Steph here today to celebrate. And you guys, how does it feel? Today's the day. Weird. <laughs> surreal. Weird and surreal, yeah. Um, is this normal for books? <laughs> massive event. This is not like, okay, when we hosted Hillary Clinton, we had a few more people, but... <laughs> but it's Take it down, Hillary! <laughs> oh my god, that's so funny. Uncle Sam for president, 2016. <laughs> We're just starting the movement good later. Damn. Is, yeah, this is insane. Um, I, I remember a little while back, um, after our first Comic-Con panel, some of the Disney executives at the channel said, uh, you know, hey, would you ever want to do some Gravity Falls merchandise? And I was like, yes, yes. And they're like, what would you like to do? I'm like, I think everyone wants the journal. And they're like, what about like a single sock and Hot Topic in the back that says Gravity Falls? I was like, sure, okay, but what about the journal? And they're like, what about like, uh, Halloween costume that's like only in one store and is kind of weird looking. I'm like, the journal! Um, and finally, Disney Publishing like had the vision to say like, hey, maybe we, you want to make the journal? I was like, oh, oh, oh. After four years of like begging Disney for it, like, you know, they, you guys took a chance on this crazy idea. And I think it's fair to say uh, that the chance paid off, right? <laughs> has read it so far. I mean, Oh my god, god, children are reading? <laughs> children are reading? We're not children. Oh I'm a major at children. children. You put your eyes from Pokemon Go long enough <laughs> to finish an entire book. This is good. This is encouraging for the future <laughs> of America. We're getting some positive reactions to it. I see a lot of smiles. All right, so Alex, how does the book stack up to what, what was on the show? I mean, does this meet the expectation that you had for it? For Journal 3. Uh, I mean, you know, that's sort of up to the fans, right? Like, uh, you know, as, as a creator type person, um, you know, you make the best thing you can, you try to make the vision that you have in your head, but ultimately, what you create, once it goes out there, it belongs to you guys, it belongs to the fan base, it belongs to uh, the sort of collective hive mind, um, and uh, so, you know, if you guys enjoy it, that means we did our job, that's the way I feel. How important was it to, that this version of Journal 3 felt authentic to you? That was the most important thing. Um, and we talked, obviously, with you guys a lot about how can we deliver the experience. I want you, when you pick up this book, to feel like you found Dipper in the park, you beat him up, and you stole his journal. <laughs> I want you to feel like this is the actual journal that Dipper was looking through. And so to create that authenticity, Every single page, canon page that's ever been in the series, all of them that, have, that you've ever seen over Dipper's shoulder for a split second, they are in this book, interspersed, interwoven throughout the story. What used to be scribbles are now text, and it all you know completes one long arc. Um, we made sure uh, that when you take the jacket off, thank you. It's 
completely the Thank book you. you saw from the show. Thank you. Jonas Brothers on the back. Very important. Very important. Like, Camp Rock, what's up? Like, it's, <laughs> it, it looks like the journal. And, and you guys, I have to thank Disney Publishing for being really creative with, you know, we snuck just in the back all the sort of ISDN information in like a little stamp here. So you can kind of believe that some, you know, bureaucrat came and stamped it. But, you know, uh, so for the most part, I feel like this looks as much like the real journal as, as is possible. Um, with the exclusion of some potential extra goodies. Um, maybe if this sells well enough, we'll be able to add some extra goodies and a re-release. Um, <laughs> Stephanie, can you talk a little bit about Black it look authentic? Like Alex said, it was really important to get it looking just like the show. He wanted it to look like it just popped out of the show and it's in your hands now. And uh, as an artist, it was really important just to try and match exactly, even though several artists have worked on pages in the show, we want it all to look just like Ford drew everything. And um, yeah, it was, it was a big challenge. It was tons of fun though. Uh, and yeah, uh, oh, and Dipper stuff too. Dipper, <laughs> getting Dipper style in there was a lot of fun. I actually, I like playing with Dipper style a bit more because he he's he's unrestrained by. And Ford is a really great artist. Have you noticed? He's like, <laughs> <laughs> and Dipper is he's really trying to be just like Ford. He's putting so much effort to it, but he doesn't really sometimes doesn't get the structure of how to draw a person or something. But he's really trying. I really I really liked doing that part. That was fun. Well, I, I think, um, you know, Stephanie was uh, one of our artists on the series. Uh, she designed characters on the show. Um, one of the many designs she did was uh, the uh, ghost from Northwest Mansion Mystery. This was her design. Uh, she designed tons of creatures and characters. Um, is there a design from the, are there any other designs from the show that you, you're particularly proud of you think might be fan favorite? Y Unicorn from the last Mabelcorn. Yeah! I come into the design meeting and she's like, hey, what do you have for me to draw today? I'm like, how about a throne made of a thousand frozen human bodies writhing in horror? Every character we've ever seen. All right, I'd like that at my desk at two o'clock. Bye! <laughs> um, and uh, what, was that, what was that experience like, designing that nightmare throne? I felt like I was one of the people in the nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was awesome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That is amazing. For those of you who, how many of you guys have seen Dipper and Mabel's Guide? Yes! So, yes! Stephanie yes! illustrated this book as well. Stephanie, how was illustrating something like this different from Journal 3? Yeah, that, that was more, that was, that was a lot of fun. There's a lot of photographs in there, so it was a lot of staying on model, and it's almost like drawing for the show. Uh, this, this was way more using the creative side of my brain. I was trying uh, that that Ford sketchy, cool style, and then thinking of these amazing different dimensions in the book and different monsters that he's encountered. That it really stretched my brain a lot more to work on this than on that. Even though that was really fun, I like drawing like. Yeah, like if you wake up and you think, like you remember the hardest test you ever took or whatever, like, oh god, this is it due today? Oh no, I finished it, I finished it years ago. Oh. You're just... Yeah. 
Well, it's, it's a weird thing because in the, in the show, you know, there's so many questions. Who's the author? Who is the author? Dipper wants to know. And now we know in reality who the author is. It's four people. It's you and me and Rob and Andy. So if you like stitched us together like some sort of Frankenstein monster, half of her face on my shoulder and my arms sticking out of Rob and Andy's like, yeah, that's the real true canon author in our dimension. Um, not as cool as Ford. <laughs> Do you have a favorite piece of art in the book? This is for other other one. Oh. Both of you? Well, I told a lot of people I'm particularly fond of this page. <laughs> <laughs> because it's super mysterious. <laughs> like, you guys have to work really hard to untangle all the mysteries in this page. Like, I don't know if it'll ever be possible, but I mean, you guys should probably deal with it. Um, <laughs> uh, I mean, there's so many illustrations in this thing that I was blown away by. The most fun part of being a writer um, is seeing the stuff that you've written come to life in the hands of whether the actor or the artist is the one doing it. And every time I got an illustration back, whether it was from Andy or from Stephanie, it was the most rewarding, most exciting experience. Like, if I had to, gosh, if I had to select one particular standout right. page, there's so many. I I really enjoy the, the this, this platypus, this stupid yeah. <laughs> Like, because that's sort of where I imagine flannel actually comes from, that there's these creatures waddling around out there that... You know, if you scare it enough, it'll shed its flannel and run off and you can knit yourself some socks or something. That's my actual spirit animals on this page. I hear courtesy of it. Well done. Alex, what was different about writing a book versus working on a script for an episode? Yeah, um, a book, I mean, they're very different challenges. When you're writing a script, you have to pay great attention to time. Our episodes are only 21 minutes, um, and oftentimes an episode would come out, and somebody would say like, I liked it, but um, why, why was it like a million other things in it though? Like, what if there was like, why wasn't Pacifica in this episode, and also, why wasn't Grunkle Stan in this episode? And it's just like, they were! Like, in most cases, exactly what you were hoping would be in the episode was, and then we had to cut it for time. Um, so, like, uh, lying on the cutting room floor of Disney Channel are just all these weird little ideas and stories and pieces. Um, and so this was a chance to, like, get all those kind of ideas back. Um, I think the exciting thing specifically for me about writing this is I've sort of had Ford's backstory in my head for a very long time, but because he comes into the series late, we never really get to see a lot of it. So this is sort of a chance to fill that in. It's it's fun writing as Ford because he's really pretentious. <laughs> so like, and you'll notice his diction kind of goes in and out because he's trying really hard. So like, instead of saying like between, he'll be like, um, betwixt these two books <laughs> what was, was located, uh, like he'll just kind of go off and then like, but then he'll like sort of nerd out and just be like, this is really neat. And you can see it. <laughs> he's, he, like he is more like Dipper than he realizes, like just this guy who's trying to be like his own scientific heroes. Aww. Aww. I've got another question for you guys. This is for both of you. What was your favorite book growing up? We're at You gotta narrow that down, like, categorically. Let's say, you mean like a fiction, non-fiction novel? We talk comic books, fiction, we talk graphic novels, what are we talking about? Fiction novel. fiction novel, and growing up we talking like, like, kindergarten, <laughs> high school, we talking like, young adult, like, where are we? Young adult. Young, young, young favorite book. Oh man, do you have an answer to this question? Dune? Hey! hey! Wow! Young! Dune fan? Damn! Dune is Holy cow, favorite. Ah, uh, there's. Yeah, I know, there's so many. I mean, like, my favorite book, like, physical object book of all time was um, just, like, the Calvin and Hobbes collections. I was just yeah! like. Um, and then, like, in terms of, like, my favorite, like, sort of. Uh, I was a huge nerd, so my, I think my favorite book 
might have been contact by Carl Sagan when I was like 11, like when I was like Nipper's age. Like, it's like a book about space aliens and you contact them and then like you have to and you have to decode the message from outer space. Like I just was Dipper essentially. Um, you'll notice any any of you who are old enough to know who the heck Carl Sagan is, like he was just like the so best nerd young. of all time. Um, and uh, he sort of popularized science, and he wore this really nerdy red turtleneck sweater <laughs> that I just gave to Ford. Like, I figured, oh, he would have the same hero as I did when I was 11. Um, like, in terms of, like, novel stuff, I mean, I obviously love the crap out of Harry Potter, just like everybody. Like, in all of those books, like, I just, like, the vacuum cleaner just, poof, like, every page as soon as they came out. Um, I, I Man, yeah, so much. First book I ever read was um, uh, Alice in uh, Through the Lo Alice in Wonderland and then Through the Looking Glass. Like, if you go back and look at those old school books, like there there are hidden messages in them. Like the very first poem, like is an acrostic. Like the first letter of every word spells out a name. Like they're full of weird secret stuff. Um, really cool stuff. So I've just been you know inhaling like nerdiness, like preparing the nerdiest thing I possibly could, just like every nerdy thing into one hyper nerd volume. So. So think of what nerdy stuff you'll write after reading this book. <laughs> think of what will happen. There we go. And this book is jam-packed full of all sorts of things that you're probably going to have to read it a few times to catch some of the secret codes and secret messages. We got some clapping. <laughs> yeah! Codes! Yeah! Yeah! Clapping! Alex, how, how is Cypher going? Are you guys following along with that? Yeah! Awesome. Yeah, the um, the, the the hunt's going really well. I mean, for those of you who've been following along, um, today we found what might have been the last clue of the hunt. It's a very, very difficult one. Um, I I'm curious. I don't know. The, the the fandom is constantly impressing me. I can never tell what's too hard or too easy. But I think. Well, as I'm speaking right now, someone might be solving it and racing to the statue, um, or not. So, um, you know, if anybody sees on Twitter, like, while we're at this event that something's happening, like, scream out to me, and I don't know, maybe I'll try to get it on the Periscope on my phone or something, because, like, we're really, really close to discovering the secrets of Bill Cypher's statue. Um, Is that a little bill up in the front? Shaking it. Yeah. I like this guy. I like this guy. So cool. I'll, I'll just say on the back. In terms of the origin of the of the treasure hunt, I'll just say that like when most people go on vacation, they like try to get a tan or sleep in. Like I put together an international treasure hunt. Um, I hope you guys have enjoyed it, and um, I'm I'm hoping somebody is smart enough to crack the final clue, but we will see. We will find out. Is that a dare? All right. Yeah, we're, we're going to ask one more question, and then we're going to do a little Q&A. Yay! We're going to do the q and Oh, one more question for you. Okay. Yeah, I'm going to ask you some better person. You can do that afterwards. Alright, this is for each of you. What is your biggest takeaway that you want readers to have reading journal for you? Oh, jeez. Putting me on the spot here. <laughs> um, my biggest takeaway. Well... When I was um, around the ages from nine to, I think, around 13, me and my twin sister uh, would spend our summers with our great aunt Lois. Um, she had her, made us call her Granty Lois. Um, this is real, that, that's where the grunkle concept came from. And um, she would take us out, uh, she had this cabin out in the woods, and um, <laughs> it, it, the, those summers were not like the Gravity Falls summers. Um, you know, we, we would wake up at like 8 a.m. and she'd be like, Time for a hike! <laughs> be like, where? She'd be like, To the rock! And we'd go to the rock and then she'd be like, Pull weeds! And then after that she'd be like, Book time! And like, like lock us in our room for just like six hours um, to read whatever book we had and then read it over again. And um, like, I remember me and my sister just sort of like pass the time and deal with the kind of excruciating boredom of being out here. Um, we would start to tell each other stories and we would start to make up what would we like to happen and we also started keeping 
journals. Um, we both had spiral bound journals and uh, we would draw everything that happened in our day. Um, we would save everything we would find, it's feathers, rocks, we'd say, oh, this rock is a fossil, this feather comes from an Archaeopteryx, this obvious piece of garbage, this crumpled piece of plastic is an alien exoskeleton, and we tape them into the journals so they're really lumpy and thick and ridiculous. Um, and uh, I go back and I look at those and it, it brings me back to that time. Um, I think sort of this journal and, and in many ways this series is sort of a reflection on the experience of childhood and the importance of, of having that imagination. Um, I think, you know, it's, it's, it's easy to be just a consumer and consuming is awesome. Um, you know, I consumed and I read books. Um, but it's also really satisfying to be a creator. Um, and I think anyone who's inspired by this show, I encourage you to take that inspiration and, and make your own story with it. Um, because, you know, I was inspired by books growing up and, and now, holy cow, I'm making one. Uh, you know, if I could do it, you could too. So I hope you sort of take any inspiration, uh, you know, from the spirit of creativity that we've created here. And I, I hope, I hope, you know, if any of there's anyone among you who wants to be a writer, wants to be an artist, wants to be an animator, wants to work on video games, start, start drawing, start coming up with your own stories, start writing, um, because, uh, you know, I could do it, so you guys could too. creativity of people and when I was growing up I loved picture books as well as reading fiction but I really love picture books because of course now I draw for a living uh, and I don't know I this might be an ego or something but I kind of want if, if there's artists out there and they see this book and they get inspiration they see weird monsters that they see uh, how a diff an artist did something in a different way I hope this help spark them or inspire them to draw it, that, just like how these kind of books did for me. Um, yeah, so, I mean, it's more for than just artists. I want everyone to be inspired and, yeah. Great to Go on, Rick! <laughs> Cool. All right. Who wants to go first? This guy in the front row. I feel like you've been raising your hand for a while. Yeah. <laughs> um, question one for the uh, artist on the right. Um, why was Mr. Blendon on a nightmare chair? Why was Mr. Blendon on a nightmare chair? That was a mistake. <laughs> Sometimes the show has mistakes. Um, that was one of them. There's no. I could like make up an answer. Like, oh, there's like 13 different blend-ins and time anomalies have created a time vortex. But no, nah, like the show's made by human people, and like sometimes there's a mistake in it. So <laughs> sorry, that answer's boring. I'd love to give you an interesting answer, but um, that one is, is boring. Um, holy cow! Point something out for me, Stephanie. What? You have the power of choice. Heels. <laughs> really? Hi. <laughs> um, What's up, dude? Uh, <laughs> uh, how did you um, create all the different dimensions that Ford traveled to? Like, what was your essential idea for all the different ones? Sure. Um, well, we had, you know, we were really trying. We tried a couple of times while we were breaking the season arc for season two. To, we tried to think of an episode that could take us into the portal and through some dimensions, and we kept finding that it took our characters away from each other and it sort of broke the show in half to, to pause and, and go into those places. We toyed with the flashback episode, but we found that it didn't really affect the present, so we had brainstormed a lot of ideas of fun, weird dimensions. Like, we had the idea that there's a letter M dimension where it's just letter M's walking around and like, how are you mowing? Welcome to the Mem dimension. And like, that it's like so annoying. It's like the most insufferable thing. Like, we had had a concept that Stan goes into the portal and he's like, get me out of here. These talking letter M's are gonna make me commit muicide. And, uh, 
like that, that that concept made it in there. I mean, we always sort of imagined that that when Ford was sucked into this sort of weird interdimensional space that he kind of was hopping from dimension to dimension to dimension, kind of looking for someone or something that could give him a hint into how to destroy Bill, that he is sort of like, you know, Bill is his, is his Moby Dick and he is, you know, Captain Ahab. Like, he just wants to take this this dude down, he's gone crazy and obsessed with it, um, and so it was fun to show a little glimpse of, the, of that. Um, do, do you have any sort of particular, uh, any particular challenges uh, illustrating this world? Oh, I, that, it, it might have been one of my favorite parts of the book was doing the different dimensions. It was so fun. I, I love the end dimension. Uh, that was fun. I liked... I like this gambling dimension. I don't know. It was just, it was just fun to do. You know, sometimes you get a move, you're like, yeah, I, I get this. I get it. Yeah, this was, this was my favorite part. And then, oh man, Andy did some amazing stuff. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah, this, um, this, this, this front one is done by our illustrator, his here, Andy Gonzalez. <laughs> I did a really terrible sketch on like a napkin that I like texted to him like late at night where he's like, what does the nightmare dimension look like? I'm like, oh, that's easy to draw. And it's like this. And I just like do like a circle with like six lines coming out of it. I'm like, you know, the circle's like a whirlwind of unfathomable horror. And these lines are like uh, gateway wormholes, like writhing with monsters. Um, you'll knock yourself out. Um, and like when he sent me the illustration, I was like, that's exactly it. You nailed it. Uh, I was so impressed that from my terrible drawing, I uh, was able to like, uh, you know, fill it with goodness from whence there had only been stupidity before. Oh yeah, maybe I can upload some of the rough sketches that we did so you can see like how these guys, like, how these amazing illustrators like saved my butt a million times by like making something amazing out of the stupid idea that we were kicking around. Um, all right, let's see, who's next? Who's next for a question? How may I make it easy? This, this little dipper right here. Show? Will there ever be a Gravity Falls spin-off show? Well, questions that start with will there ever be are really hard to answer um, because, like, I don't, I don't have the ability to see into infinite space and time. Um, like, you know, the, the show, I understand why a fan would want a spin-off or why a fan would want a special because these characters have a lot of life in them. They feel like they're alive and just because the camera's not on them, we still feel like they're out there somewhere. Um, you know, when I completed Gravity Falls, it was because I had finished telling the story I set out to tell, and also because I personally needed a little bit of a break. Uh, although, obviously, I tried to take a vacation, and I failed by making a treasure hunt. But, uh, <laughs> you know, I, I love Gravity Falls, and it's hard for me to believe that I will stay away from this world forever, whether that means a book, whether that means a comic, whether that means some other surprise. Woo! But in terms of will there ever be, I can't say, you know, uh, I, I'd say lower your expectations, assume nothing will ever happen, and that way, <laughs> if I drop a secret season on my deathbed, everyone will be pleasantly surprised. So, <laughs> we'll see. Two more super quick questions. Two. Oh, God, God. Two. Uh, two, two, I don't want that pressure. It's like all the way in the back. Another the little front. dipper in the back. Dad's shirt. Alright. He's like, yeah. Are you going to make a Gravity Falls movie? <laughs> <laughs> it's just, um, I mean, that, the answer to that question is the same as the last question. I, I have a hunch that every single one of these hands is, will there be more show, please? Um, <laughs> um, I, I can't say that there will never be. There are no plans currently for one. Um, questions, questions, questions. Uh, waving the hat right there, you. I promise, I'm coming. Here, let's be friends and pass it down. Oh, yes, yes. What's up, dude? What's up, dog? Um, oh, hi. Um, so basically, I found this picture of you dressed up as one of the characters from Narnia. Um, awesome costume, by the way. And um, it's funny because when I started watching the show, I thought, oh, this is just like Narnia on drugs. Um, There's so children present. Smile, <laughs> Dan. <laughs> Narnia, or Wizard of Oz, or Alice in Wonderland, an inspiration to 
your show, which is all about a magical kind of crazy world. Yeah, I mean, it is just a pot of all those influences. I, like I said before, I love Alice in Wonderland. Um, the, uh, I, I love the Wizard of Oz series. I read those through. I inhaled those. Um, uh, there's definitely like, there's references to references to all of that kind of stuff. I, I never actually finished the Narnia series. Did you read the Narnia series? There's kind oh, of come on, you're missing out. The overtone started creeping and like freaking out a little bit. My mic go out? Oh, I said religiously overtone. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it's time out. We gotta tell the kids to stay for themselves. Stop him at all costs. Um, um, but yeah, I mean, like, uh, so many books and, and series, I, 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 I'm trying to think. Like, there was a lot of, like, like sort of like 80s movies, like we almost did a, like a labyrinth one, we almost did a never ending story one. That's um, hilarious. Like, uh, you know, um, if there's Gravity Falls comics, we'll probably parody some of that stuff a little bit more specifically. Yes. If there were ever comics. Like, if Mickey Mouse felt like giving us some comics. <laughs> Do we have time for one more question? Can we do one more question? Do one more. Alright, one more. I think I'm gonna give it to the most loud, obnoxious friend. Yeah. 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 the most quiet, attentive, polite, demure fan. The one who's utterly motionless in the purple shirt right here. Oh, fuck. No, he did all kids. He's got like a cool, like, tambry purple stripe in the hair. Why is Tambry always texting? Um, my personal theory is she has a little bit of social anxiety and she's often texting herself. Um, hey Tambry, what's up Tambry? These guys are kind of intense, huh Tambry? Yeah Tambry. You wanna go watch Netflix with yourself later Tambry? Yeah Tambry. Like, I, think, I think she's actually kind of shy, I think that's her deal, but that's, that's my head headcanon. Um, anyway, that's all the time we have for questions. I think we're gonna start signing. Crowd assembled here. Um, you can all hold up your books.